Hello, good afternoon everyone and welcome back to those of you who were with us during this morning session and hello to all of you just tuning in this afternoon. I hope you have learned a lot from the session this morning and hopefully everyone has had their lunch and that all are ready for the next segment of our program, which is on the Forest Harvest Collective Mark. This session is brought to you by co-organizers NTFPDP, the Asian Farmers Association, the International Forestry Students Association, RECOF, FAO Forests and Farm Facility, and the Green Livelihoods Alliance. Yes, may I kindly ask everyone to put their devices on mute? Thank you very much. So this is day two of CBME uh, Forum 2021 with the theme, A Season of Learning. This afternoon is all about the Forest Harvest Collective Mark. My name is Diana from NTFPEP Asia, and I will be your moderator for this session. Before we start, some general uh, reminders. So the main uh, language of the session will be in English, but we do have six uh, interpretation languages available today. Please note that Lao uh, translation is marked as Spanish. So if you want to listen to the Lao interpreter, please click <clears throat> the button that says Spanish. So we want to make sure that everyone is properly connected and can hear the translations clearly. So just click on the globe icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen and choose the language of your choice. And for any questions or concerns, you can always use the chat box and our team at the technical uh, committee will be there to assist you. Okay. So our session this afternoon, as I mentioned, is all about the FHCM. Uh, it is a labeling and certification initiative that guarantees that a product is sourced from well-managed community forest areas where ecological sustainability is maintained fair trade is practiced, and legality is ensured, and that product quality is upheld. The FHCM initiative has been expanded to the various NTFPs, namely honey, rattan, and handwoven eco-textiles. In this session, we will have several speakers presenting about FHCM, first providing a broad overview and then zooming in on specific products. We will also have um, in between the sessions, uh, Q&A or open forum to cater to any questions that you may have. So yes, we will be keeping this session interactive. So I hope you have your questions prepared for our speakers. All right, so let's get started. I was told that the organizers have prepared a short film for everyone to view about the FHCM. So let's watch this video together. Many community-based non-timber forest product enterprises, or CBNEs, have internal processes based on traditional ecological knowledge or community policies and procedures to safeguard sustainable utilization of non-timber forest products, or NTFPs. For those with underdeveloped systems, the challenge is to document this knowledge, improve community processes, and to install monitoring mechanisms. Many CBNEs still need upgrading with regards to product safety and product quality. Also, there is a need for community groups to distinguish their products in the market and be able to surpass the tedious third-party certifications. Because of this, the Forest Harvest Collective Mark or FHCM was created the FHCM is a collective mark that aims to highlight the forest source and sustainability of products coming from forestry groups. The label guarantees that the products meet three parameters, traceable forest source, sustainability, and good quality. 
Having the FHCM is beneficial to the communities because it is a mark owned by an association composed of the community enterprises along with their support groups. Therefore, has a customized approach and highlights the distinct values of the group's products. The costs are also relatively lower and are considered long-term investments in their own brand. It is NTFP specific and processes applied promote stronger local ownership in the process of validation. Lastly, this can pool or combine efforts and limited resources for marketing for stronger impact and better recall at less costs. Our vision by 2025 is to involve more individuals and institutions in the process of establishing a forest harvest association behind the FHCM to make it more inclusive and expand its reach. By 2025, we hope to have established FHCM units at the local and provincial levels in several countries with operational systems in place. With expanding activities, we hope to increase brand recall and also engage more industry players. We are taking the first steps towards our goal by initiating a series of consultations on regional standards on select product categories. Through the FHCM, let's create a community around sustainable, forest, and community source products where all, including the producers, the value chain actors, and the consumers are engaged and committed. Thank you very much for that film. I'm sure many of you are even more curious about what the FHCM is all about. So to share more, I would like to introduce to you our next speaker, Ms. Emmanuel Andaya, better known as Nola. Ms. Nola's work on NTFP's community livelihoods and enterprise development in Southeast Asia spans 20 years, encompassing capacity building, marketing, policy research, strategy, and project development. She conceptualized various key projects of NTFPEP, including Modi Modern Indigenous and the FHCM, which we will hear more from her today. She also uh, was involved and co-established the marketing arms of NTFPEP organizations, including the custom-made craft center in the Philippines and Nature Wild in Cambodia. Ms. Nola's interests include culture and technology, and sustainable development, biocultural diversity, traditional crafts, and inclusive creative industries. Welcome, Ms. Nola. It's good to have you back on day two of the forum. The floor is yours. Thank you, Diana. So I will be sharing my screen. So um, for those of you who were with us last June, um, you may heard some of this already. And um, we already have some idea from the videos uh, that we just saw. So um, allow me to share more details about the Forest Harvest Collective Mark. So since yesterday, we have been talking a lot about markets, marketing strategies. So in one way, Forest Harvest Collective Mark is a marketing strategy, but with a combined um, goal of sustainable resource management. Why marketing strategy? Because it aims to differentiate um, community forest source products um, from other products in the market, as well as promote uh, the practice of sustainable harvesting um, protocols um, in addition to other quality product standards. So for my presentation, I want to start with, with the market. No? So here we have on one side, like the, the shapes, the triangles, those are um, like plenty of products that are found in the market. So you, you would notice that there are now a lot of um, products 
that are saying that they're natural, that they're healthy, or that they are coming from communities. So you have a lot of that already in the market. And on the other side, you have um, the consumers with different motivations or concerns. So you will hear them say or ask, um, is it safe? Is the product of good quality? Some will ask, where does it come from? And some ask, why is it more expensive than others? Um, there are some who have very clear what they want. No? So they say, I want the product that reflects my values, one that doesn't harm the environment and is fair to producers. On the other hand, there are also consumers who do not know what they want. So they ask, OK, so of all these products, which one do I get? So in this kind of market, a collective mark, so forest harvest, is something like this star. No? So it helps us see a product among, in, uh, within other choices of products. No? And with this, prod, with this um, collective mark, some of the reactions of, the, um, of consumers to this could be that they know it, and so they will keep buying it, or one, once they see it and they have heard about its reputation, they will say, oh, I have seen, seen this label before and you heard that their products are environmental and fair. Maybe I will give it a try. So a collective mark helps um, signify uh, uh, a quality. And so it can communicate or like invite consumers to try it, no? At the same time, it also raises question for those um, who do not, who are not aware about it. They ask, so what does the label mean? And in 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 this way, we are able to open up an opportunity to engage with them. And it's also a way to to um, to how do you say to share some information. So if they see a certain label, a collective mark, then um, in addition to the information that it, that comes with it, then they come to have realization saying like, ah, I didn't know the process was so hard, no? And um, they also see that um, some can realize that there is a difference. So, oh, because of this, then they realize, ah, there is a difference. I didn't know it before and now I will check for it. So there are different benefits or functions that can come from having a collective mark. So this star for us is like this forest harvest, this forest harvest collective mark. So collective marks are signs, as I already mentioned, are signs used to distinguish and inform public of certain valued characteristics common to products of uh, the members of an association and a cooperative. So these common uh, characteristics can be the geographical origin. So maybe some of you have already heard of the geographical indication. So that is one kind of um, um, collective mark. So for example, in Cambodia, they have GI Kampot pepper. So what is common to all of these is that they are grown in the Kampot region and grown in a certain way that is um, unique to that area. Or the common characteristic with the products could be the material or how it, how it is produced. Um, the ownership of the collective mark is usually by a private entity. So uh, an association is one example or a cooperative. And it is the responsibility of this entity to make sure that all its members who are using this label to comply with the standards they have agreed on. And though the only um, companies or who can use this collective mark are those who meet these standards. And um, the collective mark can be used alongside the individual brands of, of the different members. So um, the collective mark is different from a brand. You can just add it to, to signify that you belong to this association and that you um, meet the standards that was agreed upon. So why did we um, 
come up with a collective mark. So based on a study we did last in 2013, and this was uh, focused on forest honey, and um, we wanted to see what was the most appropriate certification um, for the forest honey. But during the study, we um, realized that there were many um, challenges that communities faced on acquiring and maintaining the third party certification. So here we summarize some of them. So um, you will have to apply for different certifications depending on the market you want to enter. So if you want to say it's organic, you have to get organic certification. Another market, the fair trade, another certification. Um, you want to say it's wild, another certification. So there were um, uh, certifications, but not all were able to en encompass all the qualities that we would like to, um, to offer. No? And um, I think this is very uh, well known among um, all of you. The costs of the third party certification is quite high for community groups. And based on experience, it has been difficult for communities to maintain um, the third party certification beyond the project support. And um, the other thing is also the certification is um, not permanent. So it is owned by the certifying body and the communities have to keep renewing this if they want to keep using it either annually or every three or five years. No? And usually the, the third party certification was designed for high volume products and um, was not really specified for NTFP. So this was um, the study done in 2013. So we don't um, disqualify that over that period, there were already some many um, third party certifying bodies who, who, have, uh, who are trying or have tried to um, address these challenges that community um, face when acquiring third-party certification. On the other side, we looked at the collective mark and um, we saw that we can use it, uh, we can develop it as more customized uh, that will highlight the distinct values of the group's products um, and represent the whole package that it's um, of quality, of um, fair trade, um, applying fair trade principles, that it's coming from the wild. So by, by developing this collective mark, we can communicate all of these um, qualities that we have in just one mark no? or one label. And um, based on the experience of um, Rotan Lestari that you will hear more about, the costs of um, something like this process would be relatively lower than a third party certification. And why is that? Because you don't have to um, pay like external consultants who will have to fly in internationally, that you will have to pay for all their um, um, uh, accommodations, all their, their costs, no? so that they can do the, the audit. So in one way, the, there is already less that cost. But we're not saying that um, there is totally no cost in, in this collective mark. But what is um, of benefit is that whatever cost that you put in into developing and um, conducting the process behind this collective mark is that the, the costs become an investment in your own branding and that this become um, this generates long-term benefits for for the entity that owns this label and the members who keep using them and finally since this is a um, internal and um how do you say, as we mentioned earlier, customized, the processes can be designed to be NTFP specific and uh, more participatory for stronger local ownership. So as mentioned in the video, what, what is the Forest Harvest Collective Mark about? So it wants to um, highlight both, not just the forest, not just the community, but both, no? Forest and communities. So it wants to um, highlight the sustainability and ethical source of products coming from communities and well-managed forests. So um, 
when we started with FHCM, it was first with Dorsata Honey, and now we are in the process of expanding to other um, NTFPs. But the goal is that we can cover as much NTFPs that is possible that are harvested from the forest, whether from the wild or already domesticated sources. So the forest harvest brings with it two S's, no? the story and the system of guarantee. The story is what um, helps us engage different stakeholders, especially um, consumers and market partners. While the system um, of guarantee provides the evidence that the product is of quality, that it's um, sustainable and um, it's traceable. And this then strength backs up or strengthens the story and as well as strengthens the engagement with the different stakeholders. So the story that we share through this um, collective mark is about the forest, the people, the culture um, and indigenous knowledge and the links um, among them. Usually some um, labels or certification, they just focus on the forest or some just focus on the people or on the culture. But there, we, um, there is that strong link between these um, three, you know, that we would also like to, to, um, to make more visible. And by sharing the story of the forest harvest products, we are able to, to share with the people that look, all these three are not isolated, they are connected and, and how they are um, strengthening each other. And un under the system, we have quality, sustainability, and traceability. So in the forest harvest um, collective mark, we see um, three um, beneficiaries. No? So in using the forest harvest collective mark, there, can, there will be three beneficiaries. So first, the environment, as I mentioned earlier, um, the, the, for, the collective mark un, underneath is our standards and included in the standards are the protection and the sustainable management of the resources. For the consumers, um, with these um, labeling or certification, they are ensured that they will have quality products, that their products are authentic and not um, made in a factory or made by a, a pretending community, and um, that they also are informed of possible choices um, that match their values. So if you saw earlier, there are so many products. And by having this label, it's easy for them to identify that these products match the values that they would like um, to that guide their lifestyle, no? And the third, of course, the communities, because with the, the labeling, then they will have improved and recognized values um, of, their, of, the, of their product. So not just the quality, but also how it's um, contributing to forest resource management, how it's promoting um, culture and strengthening communities. And also because of the standards, it is also providing um, producers safer working conditions. So um, the Forest Harvest Collective Mark has three key parameters. And um, later when um, Chrissy and the others discuss also the specific products, you will see um, more details on these parameters and that some are more important in other in specific product categories, but basically we have these three um, minimum uh, parameters. So first, the quality, that the products meet safety and market standards. Second, uh, sustainability, that products are harvested and produced in a sustainable and ethical manner. And then traceability, that products are coming from community uh, producers, excuse me, and they are coming from well-managed forests and legal sources. So how does the um, FHCM work? So 
So first, there should be a, a product book of standards. And right now, we are developing standards for, for different product categories. The one we started with was the Dorsata Honey. And once you have that um, agreed uh, book of standards that is submitted to the Forest Harvest Collective Mark Committee. So as of now, there is no FHCM committee and Chrissy will talk about later more about how this will be uh, developed. Then step two, we identify and form the peer groups uh, and the multi-level verification team. So the peer groups are composed of experts and stakeholders directly involved in that product category. Step three, uh, then uh, once you have these standards and once you have your um, peer groups who will um, oversee the verification processes, um, the producer groups will conduct self-assessments and their um, local groups of um, and intergroups of producers will conduct um, checks and verification. So I will explain a little more about this in the next slide. Then step four, you have the, once they did this assessment and verification, then they will have uh, recommendations by the local boards, whether um, the, the, the producer or the group can use the forest harvest collective mark in his or her product. And if not, then they will give um, recommendations on what improvements he has to make. And then they, they will give him or her the time to, to, um, to complete that. And then finally, um, once it's verified again that the, the in individual, the producer or company is compliant, then there will be the awarding and the use of the Forest Harvest Collective Mark on the product. So the verification process, and I think you heard uh, the participatory guarantee system mentioned in some uh, presentations yesterday. So in the Forest Harvest Collective Mark, it is proposed to ad adopt also this um, operational model. So um, for those who are not so familiar, the participatory guarantee system or PGS is a type of certification based on direct participation of members of the value chain. So versus a third party where you have an external organization who will come and check the different um, uh, parameters. So here it's the people who are involved on the ground um, at different levels who will be participating in the verification and checks. So um, the PGS has mainly been used to certify organic food and other agri-based products, including cotton in several countries. So um, depending on the market, it can be recognized as, um, how would you say, uh, as a uh, legit um, certification, while other markets are still um, needing the time to, to, uh, to accept it as, a, as an acceptable um, certification. So as you can see here in the PGS operational model, there are different levels. So at the, at the base is the, the producer or the weaver um, himself or herself, and they produce the, the raw materials and weave the textiles according to the agreed standards of the, of the group or the association. They sign a pledge to, to follow the standards and they participate in cross-checking and inspections of other producers. And then you have the next level, which is the group of producers and weavers. So they carry out cross-inspection plans and produce inspection reports. So they, they, they go to the other house or the other village to see how their um, fellow weavers are um, following the standards. Um, so they regularly verify members' compliance with the standards. So unlike the third party, where it is only maybe once a year, three times a year, uh, three, three, once in three years, that there will be some verifications. But here it is constant since the those who are checking are already on the ground and are um, very near each other. 
So the third le um, level is the cooperative. So these different groups, again, come together and form a cooperative and intergroups. And they develop the cross-inspection plans and review inspection reports. They manage the certification applications and um, um, how do you say, sanction non-complying groups. Um, local court, then at the... Um, the last level is the local coordination board or regional peer groups. They review certification requests and inspection reports. They carry out random inspections and testings. They issue the, cert, the, the label and then they also support market linkages. What is um, highlighted with the PGS um, model is that even if you have these checks, um, based on the experience and the approach is more about knowledge exchange and uh, instead of policing, no? So instead of saying, aha, you're not doing this, but more like, uh, so you miss this and um, you are skipping this, but this has impact on the quality. And so they uh, share knowledge, no? It's more constructive. Not saying that other third party are um, not constructive, sorry. So, but... Um, it's just that this participatory process allows more um, exchange of knowledge and also building of trust and relationships in the different um, parts of the value chain. So um, a collective mark, so earlier a star is not magic, no? It's not like you put it on your product and um, magically you have markets. There are also conditions for a successful collective mark. So first you have to have a good product. No, you cannot sell uh, a product if it's at the base, it's not a good product. So you have to have good quality. And of course it has to be differentiated uh, product from other um, products in the market. And there has to be a market demand for it. Then there has to be established good reputation of the, associ of the association, uh, which is the owner of the mark and also of the mark. So um, a mark in itself doesn't mean anything. It's actually what is associated to it that gives it the value. So you will, the, um, the FHCM association and the organizations that support it will have to, at the beginning, invest and continuously invest in, in building its reputation. Then, so that's why you need consistent marketing and promotions. You need the commitment of the partners to maintain quality and authenticity of the mark. So that, um, because if you promote it as good quality and then it comes out that one partner doesn't follow it, it already affects all the other members who are using the mark. Then you have to have systems that are working and are implemented. And um, yeah, so those are the conditions for a success, successful collective mark. So what we're trying to do now is try to um, expand the use of forest harvest to different products in different parts of the region so that the more people are using it, the more it will become visible, the more it will become um, easily recognized, remembered, and then trusted. So to close this presentation, I repeat my call to action that I did last June, that through the Forest Harvest Collective Mark, let's create a community, a movement around sustainable forest and community source products where all, including the producers, the value chain actors, and the consumers are engaged and committed. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Nola, for introducing the Forest Harvest Collective Mark to our friends and for that call to action. I really liked what you said about FHCM's two S's. It's really about the story and the, the system which guarantees quality, sustainability, and traceability. Now, let me call on next our next uh, speaker, Ms. Chrissy Guerrero, to introduce to us current initiatives and the vision of the FHCM and also the bi biodiversity-based products and FHCM integration or alignment process. She probably needs no introduction at this point, as most of us 
probably know her already, but let me introduce her anyway in case you haven't met her yet. Ms. Chrissy Guerrero has worked on community forestry and indigenous people's concerns for close to three decades. Her training is in business management and international development. She was previously the executive director of NTFPEP and stays on now as its senior advisor for strategic programs. Ms. Chrissy launched the NTFPEP training and advisory wing called Exceed and is co-founder of various fair and sustainable product marketing units such as Borneo Chic, custom-made craft center, Parara Indonesian Ethical Store. She is also the lead for our Forest Harvest Forum. So everyone, let's give Miss Chrissy a round of applause. Miss Chrissy. Thank you, Diana, for that very nice introduction. And I'm happy to be sharing after Nola's um, very dynamic presentation. She's such a great storyteller. I've listened to the story, but I enjoyed listening to it again. So I will um, continue from where Nola left off. Um, she talked about why we are trying to develop this, what we call a regional trademark or a community forestry labeling initiative. So when we, when we talk about it, we use some different words, but that is what we mean. Um, how to use a market mechanism to build trust, to, to gain exposure for community producer groups developing products with similar values of sustainability, quality, traceability to community source. And uh, this is what we're trying to do now. So um, I'll talk a little bit about what we've done up to now in general and um, some plans ahead and maybe how those in the room can uh, would like to join us and I'm, I'm happy to see in the chat that there are already some lively questions and comments that's nice to hear and gives us great energy this afternoon and um, after this session we will also be going into more product category specific uh, discussions so if you're if you if you want a little bit more detail we will we will have that uh, in the next um, speak with the next speakers okay next slide please all right wait uh, there's animation so can we well yeah all right so the first one please okay as you know um and as was presented this morning we have been working with ASEAN on several protocols for different product categories and from the first five one was forest honey and as you can see it's a popular product um that is produced by many of our community-based producers. Um, these products are from Cambodia, from Indonesia, and from India, but they're all forest honey products coming uh, from the Apis dorsata bee. And all of them have special um, ingredients, special composition for health um, and medical reasons. And also um, they have also stories behind them because they come from um, uh, from processes and traditional knowledge that have been handed down from their generations and from forests that you continue to remain standing because the communities protect them. So um, we have a collection of all of these partners who are producing this wonderful honey. And um, the, the question has always been, well, how then do we approach larger markets beyond our own countries? There are those that are asking about our, our honey and, and many in different continents don't even know about all of the factors, all of the um, elements, all of the qualities that our forest honey has. So how do we approach it together, collectively, make our voices stronger? Next, um, next uh, click, please. So how do we come together as a family under one label, under one name. So as Nala said, we become known together. People associate all of these brands with just two words, just one image. And when you see that image, you know, this means quality, community, sustainability, etc., and healthy and safe. 
So next click, please. Because in NOLA's early studies, they showed that actually for forest honey, the largest markets aren't in the US. For forest honey, the largest growing markets aren't in Europe. You, the Europeans don't even recognize Asian forest honey. They, own, they don't Asian forest honey as coming from a bee product. They only recognize their own uh, bee, which is the Apis mellifera bee. But that's okay. That's okay, no problem, because the biggest market is not there. The biggest market is here in Asia itself. And these are markets that we can access with proper marketing strategies and exposure and communication. And we can also do this together, hopefully, possibly, through the Forest Harvest Collective Mark. Next slide, please. So I'll be sharing a little bit about the history. So we started with one pilot product category, and that was honey, because we had so many partners um, producing this product. And because we already have a, um, a kind of network behind forest honey called Madudunya. Madudunya means honey world in Sanskrit and Arabic. And since 2007, we've been having the Olympics of forest honey and Asian bees um, every four years. It's like the Olympics. So 2007, 2011, 2015, 2019, and please look out for it, 2023, somewhere in the Mekong, we will have Madudunya 2023. And in these events, we already come together. We talk about learnings, exchange knowledge, talk about markets. And so maybe it was about time to talk about standards. What do we think are the standards for the honey that all of our partners produce? And there's a bit of a sound. Can our tech team help? Thank you very much. So it was uh, in 2015, we started uh, developing the standards, the Forest Harvest Collective Mark standards, just for Apis dorsata honey. And some of those, uh, some of my colleagues are also in the room now, Dr. Chin, an expert from Vietnam who has trained more than 5,000 beekeepers and honey gatherers is also here to talk more about honey and bees later. So the standards were developed and we chose one pilot uh, honey producing community in the island of Sumbawa and Indonesia to test compliance against the standards developed. And the standards took time. They took more many discussions. They took in-person discussions, Skype discussions. Back then there was no Zoom um, and also discussions uh, with markets and other stakeholders. And uh, we also actually registered this Forest Harvest Collective Mark. It's now registered in the Philippines in 2019. And at that same time, uh, the, the, the forest honey gatherers in Sumbawa Island also uh, were able to comply with um, the standards. So in the beginning, in the first kind of self audit and peer audit, um, they found that they were uh, not complying with certain um, standards, maybe um, on, on hygiene. I think one was when they were taking the honey from the, the, the tree back to the processing center, as you'll see in the photo, it wasn't covered. So if it's not covered, then you can have uh, particles going inside, you can have dirt, all these things. So they were things that they corrected in their process. And after some time, they became, um, they were able to comply. And in 2020, they were the first uh, product to carry the Forest Harvest logo. And that was launched um, a few days before uh, the first case of the coronavirus was found in Indonesia. Um, but we continue, as you can see, uh, promoting our products, promoting our mechanism um, with all of you today. Next slide, please. So as um, you saw in the video, um, our vision for the Forest Harvest Collective Mark doesn't only end with one product, but it, it, it involves um, a larger initiative, which is creating an association with all of you um, and all of those interested to become partners who will be uh, the ones behind the voices and minds um, and drivers and machine behind this association and behind this movement and behind this trademark. And with um, there is strength in numbers 
in uh, how we will deliver uh, the different standards, the operations, the monitoring of our members so that the consumers can continue to have trust in our products. So that is still in the that is still in the development stage, but you know that that is part of our plan. So can we uh, click the next animation, please, again and again? So this is our vision. And since June, we would like to update that we have some progress on other aspects of our vision that we were talking to you about. So apart from Honey, we already also started uh, working on a uh, product stand, apart from Apis Dorsata Honey, we also started product standards on Apis Serana Honey. So this is another um, indigenous bee to Asia. Uh, it's also very important for our uh, forest community. So we started on that. Um, we have also done a lot of work in Indonesia, especially on um, Rattan and participatory guarantee system of Rattan. So we've started more work on that. And also the third category is hand-woven eco textiles. And Nola will come back later to continue with, with the, her update on that product category. And also in our consultations, as Nola mentioned, um, as Nola mentioned, we are trying to uh, form uh, peer groups around different product categories. So regional peer groups who are formed of, formed by experts, both at the community level, scientists, um, knowledgeable civil society groups, those who um, have a lot of knowledge about each product category. And we've started the, 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 the discussion and we've been inviting individuals to help us to form these peer groups. And we hope that in, in the next months and the next year, we'll be able to do that. And also um, we hope that we will um, add more brands, of course, that um, are connected and associated and can carry the Forest Harvest Collective Mark label. So in discussions with all of you in the past four months, there are those that have been signifying interest. And actually for the Apis Dorsata uh, standard, we presented it uh, to producers, in, especially in the Mekong last month. And later we will also have a presentation um, uh, on two community producers that uh, did a self-assessment of their um, honey harvesting and honey uh, processing uh, process. And we'll hear from them about how they found uh, that self-assessment and what the results were. Thank you. And the rest is a work in progress, but at least you know we're moving towards our vision. Next slide, please. So this, these are our updates. So in the last four months since we had our June um, CBNE forum, um, Nola has been leading on handwoven eco textiles. She's been diligently having consultations with um, at all different hours because consulting with people in the US, consulting with people in Europe, in Australia, it's been challenging, but uh, it's been interesting to have the conversation going. So we've actually have had five different consultations in September and October because we want to make sure uh, the standards and the procedures and the protocols that we develop, we want to make sure that this is what the market as well is looking for and to emphasize the important values and the important messaging that the market and the consumers are looking for. So we want to make sure that we, we angle that properly, we position that properly, and that's why we're having these consultations. For Forest Honey, as mentioned, um, we presented the Forest Harvest Collective Mark Honey Standards for Apis Dorsata last June. And uh, with the assistance of the ASEAN Center for Biodiversity, we have all also been able to expand um, in, in, in also preparing, starting to prepare the Apis Serana uh, Standards and Protocols and we, in an experts meeting in August. And we also presented um, bo uh, both the standards for Apis Sorana, the emerging standards and the existing standards for Apis Dorsata um, in a honey producers uh, online meeting in September last month. And as mentioned, there are two uh, groups, honey producer groups in Vietnam, which are already um, starting the self-assessment against these standards and we'll be hearing about, we'll be hearing from them. And uh, for Rattan, we have just had one uh, sustainable Rattan certification consultation last October 5. 
uh, with those are from, I think we had five or six different representatives from different countries um, attending our consultation. It's just an initial one to, to get kind of uh, the pulse, if, if there are others also interested in this, uh, does it, does it, is it relevant? Does it make sense? Um, so we've, we had that and we will have a presentation specifically on Rattan later this afternoon. Next slide, please. So these are some of the realizations that are coming up from our consultations from the past months. One is in our consultations, um, some of the stakeholders are mentioning that Yes, uh, certification is good. It can help us in promotion, but there are other problems and conditions that need to be addressed even before talking about certification. So um, from our colleagues uh, from different countries, I think some are from Malaysia, some are from Vietnam, and many countries have this problem, the Philippines, et cetera. But before we can even talk about certification, we must face the fact that we do have depletion of stock, we have unsustainable harvesting going on, we have land use change on a massive scale. So uh, by the time we get this mechanism going, we will have more of this happening. So at a, at a par in a parallel initiative and with great speed, we must uh, also secure this um, uh, now, at the same time, we're developing the certification system. In some countries, there is also still some unrest, some civil unrest, which has to be addressed. And for some countries as well, the legal and policy framework is not so favor favorable for some of these NTFB um, gathering uh, initiatives. So these are things to consider. Other realizations are that from the different product categories that we mentioned, some may have different criteria or a different emphasis. For example, when we spoke with um, those of the handwoven eco textile uh, field, um, they, in, in more than one um, consultation, they said, well, we have eco textiles, they're organic or they come from natural dyes, but the image of the forest might not be the first thing that comes to my mind. And forest harvest also is not a total match to what our eco textiles um, present. So some variations of forest handmade or forest heritage or some new wording is also being considered possibly for a, a category where it is um, relevant. And for some of these products like eco textile, the, the uh, criteria of legality may not, be, may not be such an issue or a priority as compared to, for example, other products like rattan or um, wh who are looking at legality as an aspect the, uh, that the market is looking at, at that aspect. A uh, third point is that um, some subcategory, there are some subcategories like honey, and we've only done two species um, that are, all, also have a lot of variation. For those who were here this morning, um, just between two species. I mean, the new species we're working on, there are five different types of homes or hives for honey. And for each, you have different protocols. So it's a different pathway um, uh, and a different way forward, which we're considering. And as written also, for example, Apicerana, it's um, in a box hive and you can transfer it to different places, which means it also comes closer to possible you know, use of pesticides, and also since it can be domesticated, um, queens can be imported and those have questions for genetic diversity. Next slide, please. Fourth is from our meetings. We also uh, found that uh, a gov the government also plays quite a large role um, in the certification process. Um, in Myanmar, for example, for Rattan, we, we heard that this, the chain of custody is actually done with the government itself. And in Laos, uh, I'm missing an S there, um, there is uh, also it's the government who decides which certification is to be allowed in the country and also that they are the certificate holder. So these are things that um, are good to know because this is not the case in other countries, but it presents its own uh, opportunities and possible uh, challenges. Fifth is we found out that across ASEAN, the participatory guarantee system, which is the basis for the Forest Harvest Collective Mark, is being recognized, um, especially in the organic agriculture field. 
but then it's be, being recognized by government ministries that are not uh, the Ministry of Forestry or the Ministry of Environment. Uh, but they are being recognized, so there is uh, opportunity uh, to move forward in the field of forestry. We found as well in our discussions that the issue of, of cost and continuity for uh, those that are have been working on third party certification still still exists with the mechanisms that they're working for that they're using so they are also on the lookout for other mechanisms that uh, may be less burdensome. Uh, and this, the last one is that um, we also are looking internally at our own standards that we're developing and we're seeing how we can uh, tweak them to make them maybe not, not so numerous so that there can be fewer criteria or fewer uh, parameters, but we look at the main parameters, at the main ones which are the highest risk, meaning if you miss this one, then the quality of your honey will really go bad, so this is what you need to look for. Or meaning if you're doing rattan, your chain of custody will be broken if you don't look at this aspect and looking at what can be monitored instead of monitoring so many things and everything, it might not be necessary. And um, possibly looking at how some standards and how some parameters can are, are minimum requirements and others can be um, reviewed over time or added over time. And that um, a, a, a system for sanctions for those not complying uh, will be developed. Because as Nola mentioned, you know, it will be a membership association, meaning if one member in one country does not do well, this might reflect badly on the whole brand, on the whole label. So we need to make sure that we are all following the rules that we have set up for each other. Next slide, please. So these are some of our next steps. I think uh, probably running out of time. So in the next two years, we will continue our stakeholder con converse con conversations, especially with um, uh, government, considering that the government has a quite a role to play, we heard in different countries. Also with private sector, it's been very valuable, especially with eco textiles, to speak more of those at the market end to help guide us in the future. Um, as well as retailers and distributors who could possibly be um, our extended hand, um, our voice in, in the market where consumers also interact with um, more regularly. We will also try to form our peer groups, uh, especially for the new categories. Um, and yeah, for the new, for, for all the categories, the rattan, honey, and handwoven eco textile. We hope to start a piloting and alignment process um, <clears throat> for Vietnam, we've started the self-assessment process and we'll see where that takes us. Um, and also for Laos as well, there's actually PGS processes that are being um, tested now on the ground. For Rattan, later this afternoon, there will be a presentation on PGS Rattan. There is actually an ongoing audit going on now, uh, which is why our colleague, not all of our colleagues are available to present today. And there will be a pilot on handwoven eco textiles in Southern Philippines. Next slide, please. Yeah, so just to show the alignment, how the alignment works. So uh, for the PGS Rattan, it now only exists um, in Indonesia, the Rotan Lestari um, that was developed uh, through multi-stakeholder process with government, national government, local government, um, uh, rattan gatherers, rattan farmers, uh, private sector. Uh, and um, so we're, we would be at a process where we're also developing the regional standards and see how the national ones would align. So that's what we'll be doing over the next year. Next slide, please. And uh, we'll also be continuing on the standards development and refinement and um, reviewing the existing ones and um, improving them if possible. And finally, working also on institutionalization. So as was mentioned, the vision is to have an association and therefore we need to establish govern governance systems. Nola mentioned that uh, we, should, we should have a forest harvest uh, committee, a for, uh, FHCM committee. And the committee uh, are those who you know, want to help drive this process forward and would possibly eventually be the trustees of an association around the Forest Harvest Collective Mark. 
And we see these units, these PGS or FHCM units um, functioning at different levels, national and local, in different countries, and we will assist them to, for, to be established. And we'll need to develop operational manuals, as Nola said, the book of standards, and develop a financial plan for sustainability. Next slide, please. So this is our vision of our association, of how we will run the different committees that will uh, re uh, recruit new members, monitor members, then that will run an op a committee that will run the operations, and then a committee that will look uh, at our standards and um, make sure that, and look at our standards and that we're reviewing and improving them. And but we plan to have regional peer groups for our different product, uh, priority product categories. And of course, within each country, uh, we have the national bodies as well as pools of inspectors for product category per country. So I believe that's my last slide. Yes. So um, thank you for kindly listening to the presentation. And we hope you join us in our journey. And I think that there is, there might be one more presentation and then we go to question and answer. I, I let Diana then take over. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Chrissy, for presenting FHCM Vision 2025 and the association. I'm sure many of us in the room are interested to be part of that. And so, yes, after those two presentations, that provided an overall view of the FHCM concept and its plans moving forward. Let's now zoom in to specific um, NTFPs that will be part or are already part of the FHCM, so Forest Harvest Collective Mark products. For the first uh, speaker on this uh, segment, I'd like to introduce our B expert, Dr. Fung Hu Chin. Dr. Chin is the director of Mountainous Bee Development Center and the former director of Bee Research and Development Center in Hanoi, Vietnam. His research is focused on control sac brood and European fowl brood diseases and selection for higher honey production of Api serana. He has done 150 training courses on beekeeping with Api serana bee for 5,000 farmers in Vietnam and four courses for foreign uh, fellows, such as in Nepal, India, and Laos. He has done some research on selecting higher honey production and higher royal jelly yield of Apis mellifera too. He is focused on Apis dorsata biology as well and sustainable methods to harvest honey and improve rafter techniques. He has introduced the sustainable methods for collecting Apis dorsata honey to Cambodia, Indonesia, and the Philippines. Dr. Chin and his team has just recently done externally funded projects from IUCN on conservation of Apis laboriosa and beekeeping of Apis serana in Northwest Vietnam. So welcome, Dr. Chin. We're happy to hear from you. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Today, I would like to introduction of emerging standard and protocol for Apicena honeybee. This is a presentation of output from August 20, 2021 presentation. Next slide, please. Uh, what is protocol? Uh, protocol under, understood as a system of Perceptive rule and behavior. Uh, a set of rules that allow stakeholders to communicate with each other about harvesting, practice, value, production, progressive quality, and volume of harvest, ecology, pricing, and policy. Next slide, please. In uh, October 2020, the Asian guidelines of sustainable harvest and management protocol for select non-timber forest products were approved by Asian Minister and Agriculture and Forestry. 
जी गाय लाए शब परामी 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 Hani <laughs> Ecological sustainability is maintained and product quality is approved. Next slide. On August 20, 2021, in order to address the gap in Zigai with regard to the other Asian Hanji, multiple product action and partner in support to the for biodiversity based producer and along with the Asian Center for Bio Biodiversity held an effort concentration on Apit Serena during this uh, event. I got uh, contrib contribute to the initial development of standards and protocol for the sustainable management uh, of Zigbee and for the honey produce. Next. Music orientation includes some of the protocol standards and protocol emerging from that process. Uh, Polytech now will not include all the information as she is a lot of data to share and it is still being processed and reviewed. Polytech now, the process is far from over. Uh, this section is now it's a to also receive feedback and input from a people in the Asia, especially though in the maker. The input in the ongoing process on preparing a standard and protocol, both for the EU by Asian and also in promoting good quality, sustainable maybe. Uh, produce honey from community for them in Asia. Next, uh, uh, sustainability is uh, good for the env environment and also it's good for big people and it also good for the consumer. Now, now I would like to say about diversity of honey pro production system. Uh, there are five systems uh, honey production with a fish One uh, honey garden from microbe, uh, example, uh, cheek, uh, cavity, uh, cave, it also grew some big uh, people uh, who want they uh, out some uh, they make, they make, uh, artificial cavity energy and on the, uh, the rock. And that's how uh, they are charged to be to, to build the comb there and they have it done. For example, in Shagam, uh, Lao, and it's also in Quang uh, Nam, Vietnam. And also, the tool is a big thing with thick comb high, using a log square high. Uh, so uh, in, in this case, you can see the comb uh, being in the top of the look high, so we cannot we cannot take it down. So they will need people. When uh, honey, when harvest honey, we have to take out the zircon. 
ở giờ thấp ít sẽ bị cái pin ít tóc đã hài mà vì ở xăm tham chơi u lốc ở square hài sẽ chơi xe đạp tới giờ u cần chỉ ăn bị cái phơ dài dài thai dài cuông in giờ tóc bà in giờ tóc bà hiểu áp từ dây hai vít xăm hai bài dứt tinh tinh mua ở đây cần hai vết mua hai ní bị cái bị cái anh bị cái phơ ý vẫn cần đi vay cho cô luôn đi Next slide, please. For the beekeeping for them high, sedentary or partly migratory. So here you can see one beekeeper is for them high. So by this technique, beekeeper take the comb, it's easy to check the comb. And when having honey, they check the bee out and và put it in the extractor and habit honey after that thì put back the colony so by this technique can be it safe or do not destroy and we can work and get more honey the file will be keeping it for them high migratory the three to four times you know it's a grow customer and be keeper in Vietnam there are some be keeper they they have of um, 300 to 500 kilometers and they migrate maybe something sometimes to 500 kilometers by uh, by car like this here next slide please uh, the structure and format of the award 20 2020 21 presentation uh, What's the question damage of the danger to the efficient decision? How to prevent a threat to the threat? The second level uh, is to help the honey ladder and producer obtain required permit and license to obtain a pet transport to the product. The third, traceability, uh, a uh, monitoring system in place to change product and material to when manage community for that and to set the event for this next slide please. The four, four sustainability have the honey bean harvested according to the agri sustainable harvesting or the pre-ranking in regeneration, regeneration and biodiversity conservation and good quality to have it had processing practice and sure quality, safety, purity throughout the process, and shift social culture and ethical. The social culture value of the product are recognized and promote and the right of producer protect. Next slide, please. The one the weather and uh, climatic change a uh, lot of rain or the drought and sometimes in some uh, in some point, some uh, area at some point uh, some years there are so much be but some years very few now measure of actually even the second land you change uh, example, a vision, uh, are concerned expansion on for that area. So, for example, uh, palm oil, uh, plantation, and some uh, other agriculture, and uh, agricultural uh, plantation like maize and other uh, measure to control uh, lessen the impact of land use change. Uh, the third is uh, for that part. So. Uh, it's a push one protocol. It's a quick response measure for for that fire and a fire prevention measure. Next slide, please. And uh, for genetic uh, contamination, yeah, for be sometimes the colony and queen importation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, we import colony and. Uh, Queen from uh, another country, uh, maybe they make the uh, hybridization uh, and uh, avoid uh, push one protocol, it avoid evoking bee and queen bee uh, as well as long distance 
my rotary spaceship and uh, find habitat restriction, uh, restriction. a lot of habitat for nesting and food plant, uh, promote and support policy and practice do not destroy the hot tea or nesta and pollen source. Should decline of luck uh, or luck of knowledge about harvest technique. So uh, we observe even uh, evidence activity of passing or knowledge or attending knowledge building. So we have later we have to change the people or honey hunter or sustainable method. Next slide, please. Uh, seven, watching uh, and studying on honey hunting practice. So, what was Poshiban protocol? We implement effective uh, governance, mention it and sanction uh, tradition and all even avoid watching. Uh, and also, it um, is a side in hunting, you and it's a side in hunting and destruction of the group. Uh, add chemical in uh, in the um, intensive agriculture management system. Uh, Additional avoid using toxic pesticide, which is the bee for raising then one thousand met, and uh, advocate for pesticide application best management practice among the community. The nine BDG. Mainly in the Pacific European Hub Group and Sub Group, uh, we refrain from chemical investigation or, anti um, or uh, antibiotic and to cheat the region. Prefer uh, alternative techniques such as maintain, maintain strongly and uh, requiring by version queen. So, so the technique uh, apply for Pakma and for them high, but for Pikum high, you cannot apply. Then, next uh, uh, harvest. So, uh, we uh, avoid harvest, next uh, uh, harvest, next section, the root cone. Because uh, you see, uh, we, uh, 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 worker bee can uh, have the eye about only 55 to 50 days. If you uh, discharge the root uh, later, no uh, young, young bee uh, emerge. So, uh, colony uh, population in this country. Next slide, please. Uh, and uh, legality. One is a legal asset to collect the uh, protocol. It's permit to get permit to have us from. Uh, Government system or traditional government system, and also ownership of property. Yeah, normally, it's traditional recognition. Some uh, some honey hunter or beekeeper they have own some property in tree or in rock, recognizing and respecting traditional ownership and rule over property and uh, traceability. One is the user code for own processing. Yeah, it's a uh, coding processing mass container and button. A lot of words. And also design easy to use form and system for monitoring and record management. Next slide, please. And a uh, pet and, uh, and DC. Avoid chemical uh, treatment for, for disease and for, uh, and for side management. So the treatment might contribute to first disease and for a side uh, for this spread and uh, as they prevent natural selection or resistance to it. And uh, second, colony transfer. The only transfer easy or settlement might be avoid resistance uh, to uh, of tea and colony fusion transfer and prefer swamp capture to white colony transfer, colony in, in tea scrub. 
and uh, competition is local pollinator for resources. In, in, uh, avoid large scale significant, uh, large concentration of high in one place. Yeah. If we got, uh, for example, we put uh, 100 or 200 only in one place. So it also uh, uh, competition uh, it, uh, with uh, the food with the uh, pollinator and also um, zero the honey production. And you have to invest more, more, more sugar and other things when uh, it's a next season. For harvesting things, uh, uh, why activity? Uh, for the tech group, uh, to make, uh, make sure we don't uh, not discharge the comb, the root comb, and good quality management. Next, next slide, please. You have two more minutes, Dr. Chen. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, for harvesting technique, uh, on uh, with, uh, pickle, honey harvesting from pickle, uh, avoid next, next, uh, next section. Why harvesting honey and harvest only a part of, next, of the net? If you, uh, you have it on, uh, maybe an F score. And it is, man, they have uh, more time to, to be develop again. We tamba honey harvesting for tamba high, prefer harvesting honey above the bar to cutting the upper part of the comb underneath the bar. For them honey, for them, it avoid honey contamination with the big group. And now we prefer use of the super book. Next slide. Bye. Uh, generation, the production of population. So honey have it in it, some honey to the bee for survive and develop and on less some of the only swam naturally. Sick habitat conservation. So concept uh, ability and quality of nectar and pollen resources. And avoid damage uh, to the horse Seven, swimming and arch coating management. Yeah, we keep uh, avoid disturbing colony yeah, with uh, over frequent inspection. Next slide, please. About quality, but one honey quality uh, uh, raw and stable. Uh, avoid uh, fermentation. Honey should not be squared. Uh, honey should be a uh, splinter. Any. Uh, a squeeze and a squeeze uh, maybe root and pollen go in the honey. So it may make uh, the honey fermentation. This should be when the own shen are, uh, shen own, uh, own full cap and avoid contamination with the hygienic practice. And honey should be raw honey, avoid heating, um, but uh, pasteurization and uncharred printer to avoid loss in health. Medical value of honey. Next slide, please. Uh, for shape, no, no contamination. Uh, use stainless skin equipment, container, and, uh, and uh, put garage mark, uh, put in silver container immediately after harvest to prevent honey from uh, shopping moisture from the uh, environment. And on the keeper and honey collector should undergo training on correct and good manufacturing practice, hygienic and practice, and proper for handling. By uh, authenticity of origin and purity of honey, by uh, pollen analysis, now laboratory, laboratory testing against standard, and so that if honey crystallize that is due to natural process, not because it uh, imitation. So uh, to pay up crystallize, uh, which should, uh, should, uh, should be managed. Next slide, please. What I am marketing, market, get the market, maintain quality with other in the value chain. As a in value chain check, check the, she, she tell the, should also be part of the system. 
uh, to the ensure the quality even after the reception from the beautiful so documentation and protocol uh, for uh, example protection from sun and head and head are uh, important uh, the social culture and ethical uh, cultural, cultural practice support cultural practice that rerun in conservation of the and habitat so ethnic and practice to support the fair price to gather, to gather and be careful so so as so encourage continue so, the traditional uh, practice next slide please. For the discussion, the question to uh, Epistana, Honey, Gather, and Deeper. One, what is the uh, definition of sustainability, quality, and traceability for Honey, Gather, Gathering, and Beekeeping uh, of Epistana? The second, uh, uh, the emerging standards and protocol. What aspect uh, have been left uh, uh, out to ensure safety? In sustainability of additional population and the quality of additional honey. Next slide, please. I think this is the last slide, Dr. Chin. <laughs> if you remember during the September workshop that we had, um, this was the topics that we discussed during the that workshop last September 22. So thank you again very much, Dr. Chin, for that very comprehensive uh, summary and presentation on the evolving standards for Apicerana and for your guidance as always with our group. And still on the topic of bees and protocols, I would like to introduce our next speaker who is also from Vietnam, Ms. Quan Trong. She is working at the Southern Institute of Ecology in Vietnam Academy of Science and Technology. She has been working on NTFPs and community livelihoods for 10 years. Ms. Quan is a member of NTFPP Vietnam as a coordinator, and she is also a supporter of CBNEs. Welcome, Ms. Quan, and thank you for joining us today. I understand that you will be presenting about the experience of Vietnam honey groups in answering the FHCM self-assessment form. So without further ado, I turn over the floor to you so we can hear more about your experience. Thank you. Cảm ơn Diana. À, xin chào toàn thể quý vị. Tôi là Quân. Tôi là thành viên của NTFEP Việt Nam. À, hôm nay tôi đến đây để chia sẻ cái kết quả sử dụng cái mẫu tự đánh giá về mật ong khoái Abidosata cho các bạn nghe. À, tôi đã sử dụng cái mẫu đánh giá này ở hai cái cộng đồng cộng đồng thứ nhất là cộng đồng đương cờ nớ ở lâm đồng việt nam và cộng đồng ca bang ở tỉnh gia lai việt nam đây là cái sản phẩm mật ong từ hai cộng đồng đương cờ nớ và cộng đồng ca bang à, quy trình đánh giá gồm có ba bước cái thứ nhất là chúng tôi đánh giá về cái quy trình thu hoạch mật ong của các cộng đồng à, các mật ong abit dosata thì được lấy chủ yếu là từ trong rừng và cộng đồng lấy ở tất cả những cái nơi nào mà họ có thể tiếp cận được. Chứ từ cộng đồng đương cờ nớ thì họ lấy chủ yếu từ vườn quốc gia Bi Đức Núi Bà và cộng đồng Ca Bang thì lấy ở các khu vực xung quanh của vùng Ca Bang. À, những người thu hoạch mật ong họ tập hợp tại và họ thành lập những cái nhóm riêng trong cộng đồng và họ chia sẻ cái công việc này. À, thường mỗi cộng đồng họ sẽ đi với nhau khoảng 3 người trong một group và đều cùng đi tới để lấy thu hoạch mật ong. À, về cái chất để đảm bảo về cái chất lượng à, thì các cái cộng đồng đi thu hoạch mật ong thì họ chưa có được tập huấn về các cái cách thức để đảm bảo về chất lượng hay là an toàn thực phẩm. À, ngoài ra họ cũng không có được kiểm tra sức khỏe thường xuyên định kỳ hàng năm nhưng mà họ đảm bảo rằng những người đi thu hoạch mật ong là những người khỏe mạnh và có sức khỏe để đi vào rừng. À, 
những người mặc ong những người đi lấy mặc ong thường là người ta cũng rất là chú trọng về vấn đề về an toàn thực phẩm à, người ta thể thường sự rửa tay sạch sẽ và đeo găng tay trong suốt quá trình đi rừng ngoài ra họ sẽ đeo các cái găng tay sử dụng trong thực phẩm khi tiếp cận cái cái tổ mật cái bánh mật và trong quá trình mà lấy mật ong ngoài ra các cái dụng cụ mà để cắt mật hay là đựng mật cũng được vệ sinh sạch sẽ bằng nước nóng và đảm bảo được là vệ sinh an toàn thực phẩm à, những người đi thu hoạch mật ong thì trong hai nhóm thì chỉ có một nhóm từ nhóm đương từ nớ thì họ đã trải qua cái khóa tập huấn ở tiến sĩ Trinh đó là người chuyên gia về mật ong còn nhóm còn lại thì họ vẫn chưa được tập huấn vì vậy là cách thức khai thác mật ong của họ cũng khác nhau đối với nhóm mà đã được đi tập huấn rồi thì họ thực hành phương pháp lấy mật ong một cách bền vững theo những thông tin người ta đã học và theo cái kinh nghiệm người ta đã sử dụng theo truyền thống là người ta không có sử dụng khói À, người ta chỉ mặc đồ bảo hộ khi trong quá trình khai thác mật ong. Còn đối với nhóm mà chưa được học cái kỹ thuật lấy mật ong thì người ta sử dụng khoái trong quá trình lấy mật ong. Đây là hình ảnh cái khóa tập huấn mà nhóm đương cời nớ đã được à, trải qua đối với với thầy chính. À, những người đi thu hái mật ong thường thì họ cũng là những người bảo vệ rừng nên họ nắm được các cái quy tắc thế nào là bảo vệ rừng và bảo vệ những cái loại lâm sản đặc gỗ và cả ong thế nào cho bền vững. Thứ hai là chúng tôi đi đến cái phần kiểm tra về cái phần tập hợp cái mật ong sau khi thu hoạch về. Thì những người sau khi những người đi lấy mật ong về thì họ sẽ mang tập hợp tại một cái khu vực nhất định. Những người thực hiện cái nhiệm vụ tập hợp là những người cũng trong nhóm cộng đồng. À, và họ cũng được cấp cái giấy trong cái nhóm cộng đồng là được thực hiện cái công việc liên quan đến mật ong. À, những cái mật ong mà lấy được từ rừng á, là sau người ta sẽ bỏ vào túi ni lông và đóng gói cẩn thận, sau đó người ta bỏ vào gùi, bỏ vào trong một cái thùng cố định và để bảo quản mật. Mật ong thì thường là bảo quản trong một cái thùng và chỉ chỉ thu nhận được từ 3 đến 4 người bỏ vào thôi. À, trên cái thùng mà chứa mật ong thì các nhóm cộng đồng đã bắt đầu thực hành việc là dán nhãn các cái thông tin bao gồm là cái người thu hoạch, cái ngày thu hoạch và cái nơi khu vực để người ta thu hoạch. Đây là những cái thông tin rất là quan trọng và cần thiết à, để phục vụ cho cái việc kiểm tra cái nguồn gốc. Ngoài ra đối với cái nhóm ca bang thì người ta còn có cả quay video trong cái quá trình thu hoạch mật ong để chứng minh đó là mật ong thật đến từ rừng. À, đó là cái uh, kinh nghiệm và cái hiệu quả để để truyền đạt cho người tiêu dùng đây là mật ong thật đối với cộng đồng. Đây là một vài cái thông tin liên quan đến cái nhãn mà cộng đồng đang sử dụng. Thứ nhất là về cái tên của sản phẩm, rồi người ta còn có ghi về nguồn gốc, ngày thu hoạch, rồi ngày mà người ta bàn giao cho cái nhóm lưu trữ, à, ngày lọc mật, tên của người thu hoạch. À, đối với nhóm đương cờ nớ thì người ta chưa có đánh mã số của của cái thùng chứa nhưng mà nhóm ca bang thì đã thực hiện việc này ngoài ra họ ngoài ra thì các nhóm thì vẫn chưa được thực hành cái việc mà lưu trữ các cái mã trong cái kho việc này chắc sẽ được tiến hành xong thời gian tiếp theo à, về đảm bảo chất lượng an toàn thực phẩm thì các cái nhóm mà lưu trữ mật họ cũng chưa được trải qua các cái khóa đào tạo về sản xuất chất lượng và đào tạo về xử lý thực phẩm họ cũng chưa được khám sức khỏe định kỳ hàng năm nhưng mà họ cũng là những người khỏe mạnh để có thể đảm bảo được công việc này à, trước khi họ xử lý mật ong thì thường người ta cũng rất là vệ sinh họ rửa tay bằng nước và xà phòng ngoài ra họ còn à, sử dụng các cái vật dụng sạch sẽ à, có khử khuẩn bằng nước nóng trước khi sử dụng À, khu vực chế biến thì cũng đảm bảo sạch sẽ và an toàn sử dụng nguồn nước hợp vệ sinh trong quá trình xử lý mật ong. À, những người chế biến và đóng gói mật ong thì họ thường sẽ đeo khẩu trang, đeo găng tay và cả cái bao trùm đầu để đảm bảo an toàn và không có cái tạp chất rơi vào mật ong. À, các cái găng tay được sử dụng chủ yếu là các găng tay sử dụng trong thực phẩm và an toàn. Mật ong sau khi mà thu hoạch về thì Đối với nhóm 
Lưng cờ nớ thì họ sẽ cắt cái nắp mặt Sau đó thì họ sẽ cho mặt chảy từ từ Trong vòng 2 đến 3 ngày Và không có sử dụng phương pháp ép Nhưng mà đối với nhóm ca bang Thì họ chưa có trải qua cái khóa Đào tạo về việc lọc mặt Thế nào là an toàn Nên người ta thường cắt mặt và vắt mặt Ngay trong sau khi đem về Và họ lọc trong vòng 2 tiếng Họ sử dụng những cái vải bằng ni lông có kích thước lỗ là không dưới 0,2 ml, 2 ml để lọc mật. À, theo theo cái, 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 cái sản phẩm hiện có trên thị trường. À, đối với cái nhóm đương cờ nớ thì họ chỉ lọc và không vắt. Nhưng mà đối với nhóm ca vang thì họ có sử dụng phương pháp vắt. À, các cái thùng chứa mật thì được vệ sinh sạch sẽ và họ bảo quản ở trên những cái kệ ở những cái nơi khô thoáng. À, tránh ánh nắng mặt trời và ở nhiệt độ cao à, Các khu vực tập kết hàng Thì thường là đảm bảo trên những cái kệ cao Và không có cái tiếp cận với cái nguồn gây ô nhiễm Các cái khu vực tập kết hàng Cũng được vệ sinh thường xuyên Và sử dụng các nguồn nước an toàn Họ không sử dụng các chất tẩy rửa Trong quá trình à, vệ sinh chai lọ Hay trong quá trình à, chế biến mật Mà họ chỉ sử dụng nước nóng Để vệ sinh các cái dụng cụ À, đó là cách để họ bảo vệ và giữ cái an toàn và sạch sẽ trong cái mặt ong. À, những những cái người mà xử lý mặt ong này thì họ vẫn chưa được trải qua cái khóa đào tạo về sử dụng các cái công cụ hay là kiểm tra chất lượng của mặt ong nhưng mà họ thường sử dụng cái cách kiểm tra bằng kinh nghiệm thế nào là mặt tốt và mặt thế nào là đảm bảo về chất lượng. Họ đảm bảo được là các cái thùng chứa mặt ong là được bảo quản ở nơi khô thoáng và sạch sẽ, tránh ánh nắng mặt trời. Ngoài ra là họ còn hiểu được cái cách à, bảo quản mặt ong và quản lý mặt ong thế nào là bền vững. Có nghĩa là họ sẽ lấy những cái tổ mặt ong mà không có lẫn con và chừa những cái phần bánh mặt có con non để duy trì cho những lần sau. Về cái phần kiểm tra cái chất lượng mật ong thông qua kiểm tra cảm quan thì qua các nhóm mà tôi đã được khảo sát thì họ kiểm tra mật ong thông qua cái cảm nhận và cái nhìn nhận bên ngoài thứ nhất là mật ong họ sẽ cảm nhận nó không có cái mùi bất thường mật ong sẽ không có cái lẫn các cái tạp chất à, mật ong sẽ có cái màu tự nhiên à, đối với cái nhóm đương cờ nớ thì người ta giải thích rằng là Mật ong nó sẽ có hai màu. À, đối với mật ong ở cái đầu mùa nó sẽ có cái màu khác với cuối mùa nhưng nó tất cả đều là mật ong nguyên chất và chất lượng cao. À, mật ong tốt là mật ong sẽ không có dấu hiệu lên men và không có lẫn tạp chất. À, tất cả mật ong mà được cộng đồng thu hoạch là người ta sẽ bán ngay trong cái mùa vụ đó hoặc là trong cái năm đó và thường không có lưu trữ sang năm tiếp theo. Họ cũng không có lưu trữ cái mẫu đấu chứng cho những cái năm tiếp theo. À, vì cản trở bởi Covid nên tôi không thể đến tiếp cận được cái mật ong của hai nhóm mà chỉ thông qua việc phỏng vấn. Nên cái việc mà đánh giá về cái chất lượng trực tiếp của các sản phẩm thì phần này tôi không thể thực hiện được. Tiếp theo là sẽ đánh giá về cái khu vực chế biến mật ong ở hai cộng đồng à, người ta đánh giá rằng à, người ta ghi nhận rằng là mật ong có cái nguồn gốc người ta chỉ sử dụng những cái mật, nguồn mật ong mà do cộng đồng người ta thu hoạch những cái người trong cái nhóm đã được đăng ký thu hoạch và chứng nhận việc chất lượng của nó thứ hai là mật ong thu hoạch về là sẽ được đánh các cái thông tin ghi nhận các cái thông tin và đánh các mã số à, mật ong trong chai thì chỉ được lấy chỉ được đóng chai ngay sau khi vắt và không có pha các tập chất hoặc là cái mật ong ở những thời điểm khác nhau. À, tiếp theo về cái đảm bảo về chất lượng, an toàn, vệ sinh sạch sẽ và đảm bảo về cái nguồn nước thì các cái cộng đồng cũng đáp ứng được cái tiêu chuẩn này. À, khu vực chế biến thì đảm bảo về vệ sinh và được quản lý sạch sẽ. À, các khu vực chế biến thì không có cái nguồn gây ô nhiễm tiềm ẩn và người chế biến là những người sạch à, khỏe mạnh không bị bệnh tật đây là hình ảnh về cái khu chế biến của cộng đồng đương tình đó à, các cái thiết bị mà được sử dụng trong cái quá trình chế biến và đóng gói mật ong là được 
đảm bảo là an toàn không có cái cái tạp chất hoặc là ảnh hưởng từ kim loại họ sử dụng các cái găng tay dành cho thực phẩm để trong quá trình đóng gói không sử dụng các chất tẩy rửa sử trong quá trình thực hiện người đóng gói thì mặc quần áo sạch sẽ đeo găng tay đeo khẩu trang và có khăn trùm đầu và người đóng gói thì đảm bảo tất cả các yêu cầu vì các nhóm này sẽ có quay clip hoặc là có chụp ảnh để chứng nhận việc là đảm bảo các cái quy trình này ở khu vực à, quá trình chế biến thì sử dụng các cái vật dụng lọc hoặc à, với cái chất liệu là vải ni lông sạch với cái lỗ kích thước không phải hai mm à, mật ong thì được lọc trong vòng 10 ngày kể lại sau quá trình giao à, lưới lọc và các cái vật dụng thì sẽ được à, khử khuẩn bằng nước nóng và làm khô À, bảo quản các cái chai lọ ở nơi khô thoáng và sạch sẽ à, các cái lọ mật ong sau khi đóng gói thì sẽ được sử dụng và bảo quản chỉ trong vòng 2 năm đó là cam kết à, để đảm bảo về chất lượng các cái chai mật á, thì được bảo quản ở trên những cái kệ cao và tránh ánh nắng trực tiếp hoặc và tránh ánh nắng trong quá trình vận chuyển đây là hình ảnh việc à, lưu trữ và bảo quản mật ong của nhóm đương kinh đó À, về cái tính bền vững thì à, qua khảo sát hai nhóm thì đều ghi nhận rằng là họ đã quan tâm đến à, việc xử lý chất thải như thế nào cho đúng cách à, đối với cái xác ong sau quá trình lọc mật thì người ta sẽ nấu lên để tái sử dụng và nó là nén còn đối với các túi ni lông thì sẽ được gom lại à, để tái sử dụng để rửa sạch tái sử dụng hoặc là có thể là còn những cái mà không sử dụng được thì sẽ cho vào thùng rác. À, trong quá trình lọc mật thì người ta cũng rất là cẩn thận và hạn chế cái quá trình hao hụt à, bằng cách là cái quy trình lọc mật rất là khép kín vào những cái thùng à, chứa có vòi và và mở vòi đóng trực tiếp vào các cái à, hũ đựng mật để hạn chế cái phần hao hụt mật. À, về cái việc kiểm tra chất lượng mật ong trong vòng thí nghiệm thì cả hai cộng đồng này đều chưa tiến hành việc này vì à, các cộng đồng không có kinh phí và cũng chưa tiếp cận được với cái à, công nghệ này ngoài ra tôi cũng có khảo sát về à, ý kiến của các cộng đồng về cái quy trình đánh giá để đạt được cái nhãn hiệu chung à, thứ nhất là bước một là các cộng đồng phải chuẩn bị các cái tiêu chuẩn và quy ước cho cái nhãn hiệu tập thể sau đó là xây dựng một cái bản tự đánh giá. Tiếp theo là sẽ đánh giá, sẽ có một cái quan sát viên sẽ đánh giá trực tiếp tại các cái cộng đồng từ cái quy trình thu hoạch cho đến sau thu hoạch và đóng gói. Bước tiếp theo là sẽ có sự đánh giá trong phòng thí nghiệm, kiểm tra chất lượng của mật ong. Tiếp theo là có đề xuất của người đánh giá. Thứ sáu là cấp giấy chứng nhận cho phép sử dụng nhãn hiệu tập thể bởi các cái hiệp hội và khuyến nghị phần cải tiến. Bước tiếp theo là đánh giá lần hai bởi các cái nhóm đồng nghiệp. Bước tiếp theo là nếu đáp ứng tất cả các tiêu chuẩn thì các nhóm khai thác mật ong có thể được cấp giấy chứng nhận và cho phép sử dụng nhãn hiệu tập thể. Về cái quy trình đánh giá này thì đối với các nhóm cộng đồng thì họ cho rằng là nó hợp lý nhưng mà sẽ tốn nhiều thời gian và cần sự hỗ trợ để họ có thể đáp ứng và đạt được cái nhãn hiệu này. Đó là sự mong đợi của các cộng đồng. À, sau cái quá trình khảo sát và tự đánh giá của các cộng đồng thì tôi đã ghi nhận được một vài cái đề xuất từ các cộng đồng thứ nhất là cộng đồng mong muốn được hỗ trợ để đáp ứng được các cái tiêu chuẩn để có thể đạt được cái chứng nhận nhãn hiệu tập thể thứ hai là xây dựng cái cơ chế chia sẻ mật ong cho cộng đồng để họ có thể à, tiếp cận cái mật ong trong rừng dễ dàng hơn thứ ba là tổ chức các khóa đào tạo cho các cộng đồng về việc khai thác mật ong bền vững và hiệu quả Thứ tư đó là hướng dẫn các cái kỹ thuật hoặc là hỗ trợ các máy móc để phục vụ việc sơ chế lọc mật và bảo quản mật một cách đúng và mang lại hiệu quả tốt hơn cho cộng đồng. À, đó là toàn bộ những gì tôi đã ghi nhận được và các cái thông tin từ các nhóm cộng đồng mật ong ở Việt Nam. À, chân thành đó. cảm ơn các quý vị đại biểu đã lắng nghe. Thank you very much, Ms. Kwan. Come on. Um, it's so impressive how you and the honey 
producers were able to answer the form in such a short period of, of time since our last workshop. And thank you as well for sharing your ideas or proposals for the next steps uh, that you outlined after uh, experiencing that self-assessment. And now, since you are a bit uh, short of time, we are supposed to have a Q&A session. And um, we will just be shortening this. So I have noted some questions that were already placed on the chat box for our uh, speakers that came in. So one is about the FHCM process. So this is for Ms. Nola or Ms. Chrissy. The question is from Sam of TripNet. So he mentioned that FHCM is sounds like a good idea and seems accessible, but is curious about uh, your mention of the costs that would be involved. And Ms. Uh, Kata Wagner also asked, uh, how do you assess market demand for FHCM products? Do you envisage offering assistance in marketing analysis and marketing for participating enterprises or groups. So that's the question for Ms. Nola or Ms. Chrissy. Perhaps we can also put them on spotlight. So um, thank you for the question. So to answer Sam's question about the costs, yes, it would be related to the monitoring and the verification. So the cost includes both the, um, the monetary financial and also the, the time of the, of the um, producer groups who would be participating in the, in the verification. And if you saw, in, in, I guess in the experience of the PGS, there are also, so there's the local level. So I guess the costs of transportation or food will be less, but as you involve the different layers, so there will be more cross um, checks in terms of in between villages or, uh, as mentioned, there are also some spot checks or um, unannounced checks, then those costs, there are also costs to that that will be shared by the different um, members. Um, the other cost that would be, um, we have to look at is also the, the marketing cost as, and the uh, promotional cost. As mentioned earlier, if, if um, the market is not aware of what this label means, then it, it doesn't serve any purpose. So there is also that cost. At the beginning, since um, we're doing this, uh, uh, we're at the development stage, then it can be safe to say that there, we are looking for um, project funding to support this as we establish the label and to promote it. And, um, but eventually, um, for the sustainability um, without um, depending on project funding, it is um, ideal that the association would be able to cover this cost. And this means that um, members, so small enterprises, would be contributing to, to, to the maintenance of the association as well as the marketing costs. So um, maybe, yeah, we can also look at how the PGS organizations are doing, um, maintaining the, in terms of um, finances, their association. Uh, maybe Chrissy can add also based on their experience with the uh, sustainable rattan, um, what, what are the key costs that they, that they saw? Thank you for the question. I think Nola has done well to respond to that question. Um, so as we are implementing this still in the earlier, early stage, and um, so we also want to co-invest with the private sector that's also um, kind of testing this with us um, because what they've told us is that um, their buyers, especially their young, they say their young buyers in countries like Germany and the Netherlands um, are very much um, conscious of uh, the sustainability of forests and they don't want um, uh, their purchases or their product line to have anything to do with any destruction of forests. So they really want to be, um, they really want to be certified and they want to show their, their buyers that they are certified. 
Unfortunately, um, you know, some of these enterprises are also not so large and they can't cover the costs of the existing third party mechanisms um, out there. And um, we met them in a, in a fair and we discussed our um, system. And, um, you know, it's about a third, maybe Nola mentioned about the third of the cost of the the third party mechanism. So for for the 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 for the company that we're auditing now, it's a very big uh, savings for for him. And um, for us, we're just carrying on uh, a little bit of the cost um, as we're both, like I said, co-investing. But um, yeah, we're seeing that the there's there are more market players that are finding this an important thing that they want to um, to have evidence and to have traceability uh, because their, con their consumers are looking uh, for it. Thank I'll you. Take the second one about market analysis. Yes, yeah. I was going to uh, ask about to, that. Please um, go to ahead. answer the question on, of Kata. So when we um, started with um, um, developing the, the um, FHCM for honey, we also started with the market analysis. So basically, before we expand to a new product category, we um, try to um, have a market analysis and how it will apply to it. So the same with the eco textile, um, since we with limited funding, we just tried to reach out to our partners in the um, our market partners in the, our network in um, handwoven textiles and try to get um, a feel of um, what is the, the need for this kind of um, labeling and how it can be useful. And um, some of these we'll share later. Um, and yes, um, there in, it, it is included in the, in the initiatives support to promote um, and uh, to support in the marketing of the of the the products that we will pilot the FHCM label on. So for the eco textile and also for the honey, there are support for um, promoting uh, these um, those products that will um, eventually have the FHCM label. And uh, I think it's part also of the project development that we have to start promoting um, the forest harvest um, label by engaging market partners who are willing to, to carry these products. And um, so that we start already in establishing the, the name in the market. So yeah, Chrissy, did you wanna add anything? I think it, that was well done. Okay. All right. So thank you very much to our speakers for answering those questions. And I take one last question before we move into the next uh, segment. There is a question about bees, which I believe is for Dr. Chin. Uh, Warisi Sylvie Herwinda asked uh, about their experience with Apisarana bees that ran away due to heavy rains uh, that they experienced and the lack of commodities as bee feed. So he is curious uh, if there is a way to make the Apisarana bees come back and how. So perhaps I'd like to invite Dr. Chin if he has some thoughts about uh, this, if he is still here. Yeah. Uh, when it rains so much, we uh, ask him or maybe the migration to another Malay. We got, um, uh, when it's rain, we cannot go out for forest and go to take, uh, collect uh, nectar and pollen. But if they stay uh, there more, they will uh, in die by hungry. So they have to migrate to another Malay. So uh, it's, uh, in this case, you have to pick the colony with uh, sugar, Solution about uh, two, two, uh, maybe uh, 50, 50, or maybe uh, uh, about 70 to 30 uh, about uh, sugar with uh, water. Uh, 
Thank you, Dr. Chin, for that very practical tip. I hope everyone took note of that. And uh, if you have more questions, please feel free to use the chat box because we will now be heading, shortening this Q&A session and heading into the next uh, segment, which is a, a presentation on eco textiles, handwoven eco textiles. So let's move right ahead to that. We will be sharing with you a short film as an introduction. Let's watch it together. The Forest Harvest is a collective mark initiated by the Non-Timber Forest Products Exchange Program to enhance the market presence of community-based Non-Timber Forest Product Enterprises, or CBNEs, and distinguish their products, including hand-woven textiles, from other natural-based products in the market. Hand-weaving textiles are made from natural, locally available materials and are a traditional livelihood providing income for various indigenous and forest-dependent communities, especially the women, in South and Southeast Asia. The textiles reflect the community's culture and in many ways, their strong link to forests. Unlike industrial textiles, community hand-woven textile production is usually in small batches, taking into consideration the capacity of weavers as well as that of the resources. There is a wide range of raw materials that grow naturally in forests or around villages or grown around homes in multi-crop farms or gardens instead of monoculture farms. The range of fibers and dyes used includes leaves, barks, stalks of plants such as doyo from the pandan family, leaves, fuya bark from Indonesia, abaca, pineapple, and banana from the Philippines, to name a few. These are fast-growing alternatives to other textile fiber sources and are of lower impact when managed well. Earlier initiative to address the gap of eco-labels appropriate for community hand-woven eco-textiles, which focused on developing community standards, focused on four areas. Environmental accountability, social responsibility, equality, and authenticity. These standards developed by the weavers will be the starting point of the development of regional FHCM eco-textile standards. The objective is for weavers, experts, and interest groups from the region to come together in a series of online discussions to collaborate in the development of the standards, including the parameters, protocols, and processes that will be applied to, for the FHCM hand-woven eco-textile, and eventually promote and make known the Forest Harvest Collective Mark and what it represents. We invite weavers, artisans, textile experts, universities, market actors, and textile enthusiasts to join the FHCM community to promote and upgrade hand-woven eco-textiles. Thank you very much for that film, Paula. Um, last week, October 5th, there was a meeting with NTFPEP and ASEAN, a consultation on handwoven eco textiles and rattan. So I would like to call back on stage Ms. Nola to share more about this. Thanks, Diana. So I will be sharing about the updates for the eco textiles. Um, share my screen. So as Chrissy mentioned, um, we have we are currently at the consultation stage for the eco textiles. Um, and um, we conducted some meetings um, in September and October. So talking to weaving groups, experts in the field such as APADA. Um, we also reached out to marketing partners in, um, in the US, in Europe and um, Asia and Australia. So 
Um, as mentioned earlier, uh, because of the limited budget, we, we just tried to tap the network and see how um, by just having uh, some informal conversations, try to understand what, what use can uh, forest harvest label be, um, be for the communities. And here, um, I started with eco textiles, but in the discussions, it also came out the, the weaves. Now there are also the, the mats made from uh, many fibers that are coming also from the forest. And as Chrissy mentioned earlier, there are other values that are um, being looked for by, by consumers. And so here we have the forest harvest and try to add also the keyword of being handmade. No? So in the eco textiles, um, the focus mainly has been about the people behind these these um, textiles, and not uh, and a little bit on the on the raw materials. No? So in Southeast Asia, in the video, we already saw that we are um, lucky to have all these um, uh, a wide range of handwoven textiles coming from many indigenous and local communities in in um, in the region. So from textiles to, to mats to, to baskets. And behind these beautiful products are actually stories of communities, of the weavers, of the women's and their livelihoods and cultures linked to the forest. Forest from which the raw materials, the fibers, the natural dyes, the wild links that are collected so that they can plant the, the, the raw materials near their houses and to which traditional knowledge and practices are adapted. And these local and indigenous knowledge and traditions are kept alive as, as these women or weavers continue to practice these um, um, traditional crafts for their livelihoods, which in turn keep their communities and the biodiversity in their forests alive. So we see that behind these textiles, there's that um, story that link that is closely linked. You know, the community livelihoods, traditional knowledge and practices, the forest biodiversity. And um, through the FHCM, we aim to communicate these stories to those who value them, because there are already, based on conversations with market partners, that there are already those who are um, looking for these things and appreciate these values. But at the same time, there are also those who are not yet aware, no? like Chrissy mentioned earlier, that um, when they look at these textiles, the, the link to the forest is not there, it's not in their consciousness. And um, the, the focus mainly is on the textile, the functionality and the um, and the beauty, right? But through the FHCM, by having this label, we are also able to raise awareness among those who are not yet able to recognize the value of the stories we just shared. And through these, we are hopefully able to engage them and become part of this cycle. In the eco textile, so earlier we shared with you what are the minimum parameters for the forest harvest. And um, in the eco textiles, it's basically um, also um, almost the same. So in the video, it was mentioned that there, um, there are already two communities, one in, Indo in the Philippines and one in Indonesia, um, that develop their uh, standards, no? their quality standards, sustainability standards. So in the Philippines, um, this was developed uh, under a project uh, supported by a Swiss organization. Um, and this was led by NTFPEP Philippines and their work with the community, uh, the Higaunon, uh, indigenous community from Bukidnon in the Philippines who weave um, hinabol uh, textile made from abaca. So they call their standards the good hinabi practice with hinabi meaning um, woven. So in these parameters, we see under quality, they refer to consumer safety. So this could be the correct use of the chemicals, the azo-free, azo um, 
textiles that refers to color fastness, the durability of the fibers, the, the stability of the textile. For sustainability, they mentioned sustainable cultivation or harvesting of the raw materials, especially for fibers that are harvested from the, from the forest or natural dyes, if they are able to be uh, cultivated. Um, safe and clean production. So this includes the water management, the water disposal, especially for those that are using um, some chemicals for dyeing. Um, also, sustainability also refers to fair labor um, practice and wages, safe and cleaning, uh, sorry, safe and clean working conditions. And also, um, since we're working a lot with indigenous communities, this also refers to cultural protection and promotion. And for the traceability, this includes the traceable sources of raw and um, auxiliary materials. So as mentioned, so where are the, um, the raw materials coming from? Are they coming from the community? Uh, and are they from um, legal sources? Although here in, in the eco-textile um, category, the legality is not really an issue as many of the raw materials can be harvested in nearby, um, just around the villages or can even be um, transplanted in the, in the household gardens. Then traceability also um, gives importance to the location, the source, and which has a link to the authenticity of the, of the textiles, no? of whether they're really coming from that specific indigenous community and also the design. So as you can see, as we go um, more into the product, uh, more specific to products, then there are more details that are uh, more specific. And if you look at the different textiles and weaves that we have, they have also different fibers, so different sources. So when it comes to sustainability, then there will be different details in terms of har um, what is the sustainable harvesting process for these different um, fibers or, or um, natural dye, whether they're leaves, barks, um, yeah, or fruits. So, I mean, those details will be uh, further developed um, as we go along. And then um, based on the discussion with the different stakeholders, these are some of the benefits that they see or experience with having uh, some standards and also labeling. So for the community, um, just having the standards for them was already a big benefit because it helped improve the quality uh, of, their pro uh, of their products and provided the basis for the pricing. No? So um, this translated to improve perceived values of the products and eventually their incomes. And um, it also helped in creating safe working conditions for the weaver. So before they, there was really not much attention given to where they dispose of their um, dying um, water. So it went, and before they were already, they were using synthetic dyes no? and um, chemicals. So um, with these standards introduced, they, this helped improve and make sure that their um, environment um, and source of water and their um, vegetable uh, where they plant are safe from, from these chemicals. For the market partners, um, the main benefit for them will be the, the stories and additional information that support their marketing efforts and also um, helping them make sure that they have quality products. For the consumers, it's more the intangible value in the products that they acquire. So beyond the, beyond the, the um, the beautiful product that they have, there are also the stories that come with it and the value, knowing what these textile mean, not just as a product, but to what other um, benefits it has, then that has more, um, how do you say, sense of fulfillment for consumers. And of course they have sure uh, ensured quality and authenticity that their products are not um, fake 
that they are really coming from the communities that they 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 um, expected to come from especially in this time of digital marketing where they don't are not able to go to the place itself and buy these products so some of the key feedback no so Chrissy already mentioned some of these things about um, the there are two sides of the market, no? like I mentioned earlier, there are those who already know what they are looking for. And so having this label is already um, helpful to, to, to help them choose what products matches their values. On the other hand, there is also that part of uh, um, the consumers who, who are not yet aware of, of these links, no? of this... Um, um, how do you say the values that these products also intangible products that these products um, also have and so in a way it opens having these label sorts of like you know um, and nudges them to 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 be more aware and uh, to ask questions and I think it was the same in the case of the FSC before there was no FSC but then um, people started to see ah it's important to have to have this kind of, um, of uh, there are different kinds of paper no, that um, is coming from sustainable forest and not. So in a way, this kind of la label can also open up new, new markets or um, engage new um, consumers. So some of the key feedback as we tried to develop the standards for the eco textiles was first, of course, the first important step is to define the scope. So many of the eco textiles in uh, many of the communities already use, do not grow their own cotton, even if traditionally they grew their own cotton. Um, now they, uh, they just buy it because it's cheaper and it's much easier to do. So not everybody are already using fibers from the forest, but there are still many of them who are doing so. So um, as we do this eco textile standards, we have to define the scope. So which materials, raw materials are we looking at? Um, so the source of the barks, the fibers, natural dye, the wildlings that are sourced from the forest, maintained in the gardens. And um, we also see that the maintenance of the raw materials contribute to reforestation, enrichment plantings, and we also have to determine the cover the what are what geographical region are we covering. So this will help us in identifying potential partners um, as we move along. Um, then there's also the uh, key. Um, uh, suggestion to streamline the process and minimize the cost. So um, in cost in terms of time and financial. So they want to they um, uh, emphasize to watch out for too much bureaucracy. And the cost assessment should also include the time of stakeholders and who will and be clear about who will cover the cost. So in Chrissy's example earlier, the, it's a sharing between the project now and also the um, commercial partner. So right now there's no cost to the community. So, so those things and, and also with the design of the FHCM that there is the association and then you have the member. So how, how will the costs be shared? And they also, um, highlight that to move forward with this, if only it will add value, you know? So we have to take into consideration already that producers and the retailers are already busy with the production and the operation. So integrating the, the, um, the monitoring of the standards, how, how we do it in such a way that it will not be additional burden for the different um, stakeholders and of course it will depend on the target market so um, as we move along we will um, refine this market study and see which market um, segments require this um, uh, labeling but as i mentioned earlier this label um, this labeling can also 
be helpful in creating a market out there that will give value to these um, values of the products that we have under FHCM. They also um, highlight the need to support this um, initiative with com communications and market engagement. Um, consumer education and awareness raising is key. The stories and the information need to be communicated well, and we need to highlight the people behind the product. And I think based on the discussion with them, this is really one of the key um, factors that why people are buying. No? Aside from the function and the beauty of the product, it's really the people behind the product. And if we remember yesterday from the discussion of Mr. Ruggianto, the, that now um, the, the, there is that um, branding strategy that people are looking for brands that care, that shows empathy and are um, loving. No? So this, the, the stories that we share that, uh, that we're talking about with the, um, behind the forest harvest actually match this, um, this thing that the consumers are starting to look for. And then um, link the label to more accessible information. So the, the it doesn't stop with the, with the label. We really have to provide and find a mechanism where we are able to provide um, ready information and more information about the product. So there was a mention of the QR code with the label. So um, even the name of the weaver. So all of these things actually uh, give more um, value, but also makes the product less uh, beyond what is the tangible, no? And then um, there is also the feedback the, or suggestion that to um, make, to get more um, producers to, to, do, to, um, to follow the standards is to incentivize these uh, standards and turn it to an, an aspiration of producers. Of course, not everybody will be immediately able to move from class B to class A or, or you know, different um, levels of um, quality, but maybe through the use of awards, um, we are able to incentivize or to give incentives and award, um, award those who are able to follow the standards. And then it becomes an aspiration for other producers to follow. Um, Hi, Ms. Nolan. Sorry to interrupt. You have a minute left. Thank all you. All right. So then um, the basic feedback also is that this is an immense undertaking, but is a necessary for, for some markets. So there we have uh, trends in the market that already show more awareness on sustain sustainability and show the need and use for this. So this is a big difference from, from markets from 10 years ago. No? So this is a right time in a sense to do this. And ba ba um, again, uh, final word on the feedback is that it's basically coming down to relationship building. So we have to engage and create a community and movement around these products. So for the next step, so we will be developing the regional standards in October, sometime October or November, form the regional peer group for Eco Textiles, also in the same time frame identify and target community and pilot uh, regional standards to have at least one group awarded with Eco Textile. So this is between November and February and the promotion and market engagement for FHC and Eco Textile pilot group from November to February of next year. So we're inviting everyone here um, with us to, to collaborate if you're an expert and or, you, or a resource person. So please join us in the development of the regional standards through an online workshop. Also, if you're interested, we're also um, looking for regional peer group members and um, endorsers and champions for the FHCM Eco Textile Mark in your networks, support in the promotion of the FHCM Eco Textile, and also, we would um, appreciate very much any funding support to continue the work of FHCM development, expansion, and promotions. So for the photo credits, so the textiles that you have seen, you will see this um, um, CBNEs in the CBNE gallery on the Forest Harvest um, Forum. So thank you very much. Thanks, Ms. Nola.
And we'll move right ahead. So if you have any questions for Ms. Nola on the Echo Textiles, just please put them in the chat box. Our next presentation is all about Kratan. And we have a video to show you as an introduction before we call our next speaker. Thank you. The Forest Harvest is a collective mark initiated by the Non-Timber Forest Products Exchange Program to enhance the market presence of community-based Non-Timber Forest Product Enterprises, or CBNEs, and distinguish their products, including rattan, from other natural-based products in the market. Rattan is a natural climbing plant that grows in rainforest or in rattan gardens. Currently, there is a growing demand for sustainable products, especially in Europe and Asia for rattan. Although, rattan production at community level has declined over the years due to the lack of policies that support rattan farmers. Because of this, NTFPEP initiated the Participatory Guarantee System, or PGS, for Rattan. PGS Roles, or Rattan Lestari, which means Sustainable Rattan in Bahasa Indonesia, is an initiative that aims to apply an appropriate, effective, cost-efficient certification to Rattan. This guarantees that Rattan is harvested and managed sustainably. Through certification, there is an opportunity to provide added value to rattan farmers and rattan gatherers and at the same time, promote the processing and the sustainable management of rattan. Now, we will tell you more about how the PGS rattan system works. The first step is the establishment of the PGS unit which involves organizing a multi-stakeholder process to review PGS Roles applications in the process. These units are comprised of local government officers, Latin producers, and private sector stakeholders. After the meeting, the next step is to establish the PGS unit. The farmers will then undergo training their training would comprise of recording their harvest, documenting, and writing down their harvest techniques. Afterwards, there will be an internal review or self-assessment. The fifth step will be an audit which includes a peer inspection. Finally, there will be a certification committee meeting to provide feedback and recommendations to comply with the standards. The standard consists of five criteria, legality, production sustainability, ecological sustainability, social cultural factors, and traceability. Once satisfied, the PGS Roles certification will be issued to the community. The PGS Roles certification is more suitable for small producers like rattan farmers, for it lessens cost and are built on indigenous knowledge and thus are more appropriate for specific species being monitored. Let us work together towards a sustainable future for the ten. Thank you very much for that video. I'd like to introduce our next speaker for Ratan. Ms. Natasha Muliandari, or Natasha. She has worked on community resource management for the last nine years. She has been involved in alternative certification, specifically the PGS, Participatory Guarantee System, Rattan Initiative in Indonesia, since it started in 2012. She is also the Indonesian point person for ecological monitoring and participatory resource monitoring for NTFPEP Indonesia. Ms. Natasha is the Deputy Director of NTFPEP in Indonesia. I'd like to call her on stage if she is here. I believe I was told that she was uh, in actually doing a rattan audit today. So if she is unable to present, I'd also like to call back on the floor Ms. Chrissy Guerrero, who will also be assisting in the presentation. Thank you. Ms. Natasha or Ms. Chrissy?
Okay. Um, I think Natasha is quite busy. So uh, she's asked me to help her make this presentation as she's now in another city completing an audit process. Um, yes, so good afternoon. Good afternoon uh, again to everybody. And this is the last uh, presentation I think for today. Uh, so thank you for everyone who is continuing to listen and who finds this interesting and relevant and useful. So as mentioned earlier, um, we are uh, expanding to three categories from uh, categories of products and one being uh, Ratan. And we share more about what we've been doing on participatory guarantee certification for Ratan. Uh, we know some of you have been attending um, our meetings, our consultations, and also um, um, our forums. So some of the images might be the same, but uh, we ask you to bear with us as we see many new faces and many new names with us today. Um, so on behalf of Natasha, I'd like to present her presentation. Next slide, please. Yes, yeah, so um, many know as well that uh, the Indonesia is a large source of rattan products. Uh, maybe some don't know that Indonesia is supposedly supplies 80% of the raw rattan global demand. Uh, this is uh, this information is a bit dated, but I would still say that a lot of it comes from this country, with 350 species only found here. A species 350 species found here, and globally 600 species found around the world. Um, many people depend on rattan itself. Five million people, as written here, though many uh, rattan farmers and producers are suffering with um, some of the policies that have now left prices for farmers and gatherers very low. But uh, opportunities are, are coming up and this is with the growing demand for sustainable products as Nola has also shared. Um, and through certification, we may be able to promote um, uh, premium price uh, values, additional values to return. Uh, but as mentioned, some other mechanisms also are quite costly, and therefore we're developing this participatory guarantee system. And I present the system called, called Rot Roles or Rotan Lestari that's developed here in Indonesia with various uh, stakeholders from the government, from NGOs, from the Rattan industry, and from the Rattan farmers and artisan sector. Next slide, please. So as you can see, it was started in 2012 and it's now 2021. So it's a long process and I'll show you the timeline on how we've been moving forward. So we started in 2012, piloting in two sites in, in Kalimantan as, as well in Sulawesi. Um, and these have different species of rattan and the, the one in Kalimantan is cultivated in rattan gardens, whereas in Sulawesi it's growing um, from the wild and we, um, yes, and uh, we'll speak more about our audit process. So here you see some photos of the rattan and uh, our staff also meeting with rattan producers and processors. Next slide, please. So um, as you, uh, as we have pre pre presented in, in our videos and in our other presentations, um, the standards that were developed look at five criteria, five general criteria of legality, which looks uh, make sure there's no overlapping or competing claims in the areas where the audit will be conducted, um, that there's a permit to harvest, or that there is um, there's no legal impediment that uh, prevents the group from harvesting and transporting their their rattan products. We also look at two kinds of sustainability. One is that the um, the plant itself, or, or the, the 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 um, the population of of rattan itself, is not being diminished by the harvesting that's being conducted. Meaning that there's no over harvesting. That we're making sure there's regeneration of the plant, and that there's monitoring. Second, ecological sustainability. We're also making sure that no other species are um, 
affected adversely and that, that biodiversity is not affected in the area and that waste management is being implemented and no harmful and banned chemicals are being used. Uh, for social cultural aspects, we're looking at fair trade, ethical practice, um, no child labor, and that there are there is capacity building in, installed in the process, and that there are conflict resolutions and benefit sharing mechanisms that are in place, and that the Bretagne can be traced back to the communities and traced back to its origin. Next slide, please. So this is the timeline. Earlier, we said we started in 2012, and this is how we progressed. So in 2012, we actually started meeting with those who had been working on uh, third party certification and had been sharing the opportunities as well as challenges involved. And in 2013 and 2014, we decided to launch here in Indonesia, this uh, Rotan Lestari or Sustainable Rotan process based on participatory guarantee system. And we started this in, in Kalimantan, we had national workshops um, and uh, district level workshops. And then in 2015, the National PGS uh, Rattan Council was formed. And if, if you see in the picture, there's these women who um, already uh, were certified, their baskets, we brought them as well to international fairs, um, where they also gained interest uh, from some of the buyers uh, that they met there. Uh, in 2016, we did pilot testing in Sulawesi and we made deliveries to the UK. And um, in 2018 to 2019, there was communications with um, rattan ba basket uh, buyers in Europe. Um, and uh, the process should have ended much earlier, but because of the pandemic, it's just coming to an end uh, now. And we also have a, a process ongoing with the US-based rattan bag company. So this is how it's proceeding. And we hope the images help with trying to visualize our journey. Uh, next slide, please. So these are some images of how this um, happens on the field, in the field. And the orange is one part of the process and the green arrows are another parallel process. So while the PGS unit is being established, which includes um, government sector, uh, private sector, local farmers, um, then the rattan harvesters are also being trained in parallel. So the unit is being established. They're also putting together their mechanisms, uh, identifying the inspectors, etc. And that happens in parallel. And next slide, please. And these are just some benefits that they gained. So there were communities that increased their prices 10% and in some 50%. Uh, but in the Weaver groups up to now, because they they even if they gain 10 or 20 percent, they still feel it is um, very beneficial for them to receive these increases. And that was in Kalimantan and Sulawesi when we worked with a you, you buyer in the UK, they increased the prices 50 percent and they were very happy with with that. Um, and because they followed the PGS process and they were more organized and systematic. They were also able to attract others in the local industry who also raised their prices to, for their attack. Next slide, please. So this is um, uh, the rattan producer, rattan gatherer in Sulawesi, who was sharing with us uh, as well that not only is not only about the increase in price, but also that they have better uh, working relationship in the village as they're more transparent, they're, 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 um, the PGS process has helped them to ensure the quality of their product and they have more pride in their knowledge uh, as threatan gatherers. Next slide, please. So we come to some of the learnings, especially in the audit, audit process that's ongoing now. Um, and this is also sent uh, from Natasha as she continues um, the audit process. She's saying uh, that um, that it's important to stress that the, the benefits go beyond the market price as the premium. Uh, for example, in Kalimantan, in conserving their rattan gardens, they also conserve the source of their food and the source of their ritual materials. So these are things that uh, 
might go overlooked. And um, we were also happy to note that um, with our process there, some community members um, decided not to sell some of their rattan gardens to some expanding monoculture plantations with some realizations about the values of their rattan gardens. Other learnings are in coordinating with the company in that uh, sometimes uh, um, information is not so freely shared um, and it takes a lengthy process for that. Uh, so discussing about uh, non-disclosure agreements and all of this is important. Furthermore, in coordinating with the government, it's also in, important to institutionalize this process um, and to have continuing collaboration at different levels. At the PGS unit stage, um, it's important that there's distribution of skills and knowledge and documentation across the PGS unit members um, and that the, uh, it's important to maintain the system, meaning that each um, person in the unit has different um, roles and tasks and that will maintain the sustainability instead of investing only in one or a few people in the system. Um, also, it's important to train enough personnel to perform the different roles, as, as mentioned here, the ones doing coordination, the ones doing uh, the inspection. And finally, in the audit process itself, the learnings are that this does develop us, this does present a, a learning space for farmers and the company. However, the audit agenda and empowerment capacity building process are separate and different pers personnel should be doing that to maintain no, uh, no conflict of interest um, in the field. And finally, during this pandemic, we have seen that the decentralized PGS scheme and having the PGS unit at the local level enables the audit process to continue um, despite the pandemic, because uh, otherwise we'd have to have uh, foreign um, auditors and or auditors from other islands um, uh, in, in doing inspections, and that is very challenging. And last slide, please. I think the last slide is just a photo of the meeting we had last week, where we had a small roundtable discussion with colleagues from Malaysia, Indonesia, Myanmar, Laos, Vietnam, and the Philippines. And some of you are here in the room today um, when we presented also about um, participatory certification in the realm of Rattan. Uh, these were the five things that we were talking about uh, that came that emerged. One is that um, the cost effective certification mechanisms are still being sought for um, because the ones that exist are expensive and it's difficult to, difficult to continue or renew them. The second is that some processes are in the realm of government, chain of custody or certificate holders or in the realm of government and therefore discussions are needed. And so we're, we're, we're of course willing to, to undertake that in uh, if that is necessary and important. Um, also PGS is being implemented for other NTFPs um, in some of uh, some ASEAN countries especially, but under different departments and for different kinds of commodities like organic agriculture, organic products. But opportunities exist because they already exist in those countries. Um, for some countries, they've said that certification for sustainability is not yet being demanded by all their buyers, but they see the trend in that direction, and it might be good to be prepared. And in other countries, enrichment planting is needed before talking about certification. So that's my last, that's my, that's Natasha's last slide. Um, and thank you very much for listening. And we hope that you can continue with us in our journey. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Ms. Chrissy, and also to Natasha. Unfortunately, we don't have that much time for a Q&A, but I did take note of a few questions in the chat box, so maybe we can take one or two questions. The first one actually is uh, a request for more information on FHCM, and I think we can just uh, place information on that to follow. And then the second question would be from Mr. Elpidio Peria. And he is asking about the item on institutionalization with the different levels of government. So what are these and which are doable and which are strategic? So I invite our resource persons 
if anyone would want to answer this question. Yes, thank you, Ping, for the question. Um, for uh, Rotan Lestari, Sustainable Rotan in Indonesia, the project was started um, side by side with the national government and local government um, individuals and institutions. So, for example, now the audit process in the field, it involves um, uh, stakeholders, for example, of the local department on um, trade and industry, local department of forestry. Um, so that, that continues to go on uh, because at that level, there is not a lot of change, but at the national government level, um, there is, you know, um, what do you call it? Um, changes where they're changing the structure of government, they're moving people into different positions. And therefore, um, those that had been with us in the process, you know, who had been in our discussions at the national level, who had gone into the field, et cetera, had changed. There was turnover in staff. And therefore, we're, we're trying to discuss a more institutionalized process, meaning that there's an actual, um, uh, they call it here, ESCA, a certificate, um, uh, a certificate decision and that it's clear who uh, which divisions in government would coordinate so if if people are moved in their positions then um, we wouldn't have like gaps there so that's what that that uh, that means and th there's a process of how we're trying to implement that here in Indonesia um, th so that was that that's what was meant by that and uh, yes, it's strategic and it's doable. It just takes time. And in the pandemic, uh, it's been more difficult to uh, pin down the government on different things. And there have been some moves of restructuring and um, uh, movement of stuff, but this is still part of the plan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would you like to add anything to that, Ms. Nola? No, I'm good. Thank, no, you. thank you. All right. And may I request Ms. Kwan, Dr. Chin, and Natasha, if she is here, to turn on their videos so that we can all give you a very warm round of applause. Thank you for your contributions to making this uh, session really interactive. Mm -hmm.